Hello and welcome to today's psychology catch-up session for Carlin Cymru. This session will be delivered by myself, Miss Bellis, and I teach psychology at the Allen School. All of the resources from this session will be available on the Carlin Cymru website after this video. So today is our third session and we're going to look at the individual differences explanations of schizophrenia. We're going to have a look at the core knowledge and the research around the cognitive and the psychodynamic aspects of schiz. So like the other two sessions that I have done, this session looks at the study of behaviours. Um, which is section A of your unit three exam. So within your school, you will have looked at two behaviours this year um, and I'm focusing these sessions on schizophrenia. What we need to know is to understand biological individual differences and social psychological explanations for the behaviour. So focusing then on schizophrenia, we have looked at our two biological explanations so that was the dopamine hypothesis and structural abnormalities and today we are moving on to our individual differences which is psychodynamic and cognitive in this session we're going to com combine the two together and um, lots of the elements of these are in development from what you did in year 12 so the cognitive approach um, that you did in year 12, this just carries on and furthers your knowledge of that. And then psychodynamic approach also builds on your knowledge of Freud and his theories. So starting off today then, by looking at this cognitive explanation. One of the th first things I want to talk to you about is, in the exam, um, if these questions, if this element of um, the course was to come up, it would ask you uh, to describe an individual differences explanation of schizophrenia or describe a cognitive explanation of schizophrenia. You need to remember that within this realm of individual differences is cognitive and psychodynamic. Each year when I am examining or um talking to my students that's something that they get quite mixed up with so you need to make sure that you know cognitive and psychodynamic come underneath that title of individual differences so that you don't get confused if it comes up in the exam okay so starting off with our cognitive explanation then and this slide is just giving you a little bit of background on that it says even though hallucinations are experienced by many with schizophrenia it's actually estimated that between 2.5 to 4% of the general population have experienced a hallucination, most of whom are not diagnosed with a psychiatric problem. Now, I'm sure if you to really think about it, there have probably have been times when maybe you've been overtired or maybe you've um, been very, very hungry and you may have thought something happened that actually didn't happen. Um, for example, I always feel as though my phone has vibrated um, in my pocket or I have um, a smartwatch and sometimes I feel like my smartwatch has vibrated and it hasn't. Okay, that's a hallucination, isn't it? That's thinking something's happened when it's not. And although that, you know, doesn't mean that somebody has schizophrenia, it is quite common that people experience hallucinations the difference between somebody that has schizophrenia and somebody that doesn't is the way they interpret that. Normal functioning humans would say, oh gosh, I'm very tired today, or um, I need to go to bed early, or oh, that was strange, I thought my phone vibrated. Whereas people with schizophrenia would assess that information inappropriately, and they would think that either something was after them, or it was the devil speaking to them. And it's that that's the difference. We can identify it in a more rational way whereas people with schizophrenia always think that something bad is going to happen. Your first researcher is Anthony Morrison and he 
try to explain the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Remember, positive means in addition to normal behaviour. He proposed that triggers such as sleep deprivation can cause some individuals to hear voices in maladaptive ways. Then this next part is what I was just talking about. The individual assesses the values of these voices inappropriately. And they say, for example, that they belong to the devil. So they're very, very sleep deprived. They start possibly to hear voices and start to hallucinate. And they automatically think, oh, it's the devil that's talking to me. This then elicit behaviours such as social withdrawal or self-harm. Remember, behaviours surrounding schizophrenia are always quite extreme. So if you have schizophrenia and you think that the devil is talking to you, then you could either withdraw from society, so not go out, or you could think that the only way out of this is to harm yourself. What then happens is the emotions that these behaviours produce, normally sadness or shame, which is quite normal, isn't it? You know, if you withdraw from society or you hurt yourself in some way, you are going to feel sad or ashamed. And what that does is it reinforces the messages being offered by the critical voices, causing them to be perpetuated in a vicious circle. So what then happens is because the messages are reinforced, then they think the devil is talking to them more, then they assess it inappropriately, then they withdraw socially, which means that they then feel sadness and shame even more, and it's a continuous this vicious circle that they are on. Now, the easiest way, I believe, that you can remember all of this is to put it into a flow chart, and that's what I've done on this slide. So you can see that it says sleep deprivation causes you to hear voices. You assess it and that is an inappropriate assessment. Maybe it's the devil, which leads to social withdrawal or self-harm. Could produce emotions such as sadness or shame that reinforces messages being offered by the critical voices. And then they also then think that maybe they are the devil. And that is your idea of the vicious circle. You continuously go round. And that's how Anthony Morrison would explain those positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Now, one thing to remember that this flowchart is just there to help you remember. It is not a flowchart that Anthony Morrison created. So when you're writing an essay, don't put Anthony Morrison's flowchart suggests. OK, the flowchart is literally just a visual guide to help you understand his theory. So Anthony Morrison, like I said, were positive symptoms. And then you also have Aaron Beck, who explains negative symptoms. Now, lots of you may be quite familiar with Aaron Beck and his research. Um, he is widely used amongst um, mental illness and depression. And he was also in your cognitive approach um, for year 12. So we know that the cognitive approach has traditionally had more difficulty explaining the negative symptoms of skits than, for example, hallucinations. There isn't a specific theory that is linked to negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So what they've done is they've taken a well used and understood theory and they've applied it to those negative symptoms. So Aaron Beck have drawn heavily on the idea of the cognitive triad usually used to explain depression, to also offer a reasonable model of the negative symptoms. Now, if you remember the cognitive um, side of the negative symptoms, so think about your characteristics of schizophrenia, you know, allogia, anhedonia, it's flatness of effect, it's the idea of being quite withdrawn from society, not speaking very much, not going to work, not doing um, activities or hobbies that you once enjoyed. They are all symptoms of depression, aren't they? And that's how schizophrenia can often be misdiagnosed as depression. Um, so it seems quite fitting, really, that they use Aaron Beck's cognitive triad to link to these negative symptoms. Now, the cognitive triad is 
three elements and they again get you in a very pessimistic, very glass half empty view of the world, the future and of yourself. He proposed that the individual endorses dysfunctional beliefs about their performance and their ability to experience pleasure. They also hold a very cynical and gloomy view of the future. Their mental filters only allow in negative messages and deficits in information process bolster their pessimistic view. So no matter what people say to them, they're always very negative about behaviour or about a situation. And they say that these lead to the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So like I said before, flatness of effect, abolition, which is in a diff indifference to your surroundings, and then anhedonia, not reacting appropriately to pleasurable experiences. So much like the biological approach, the cognitive approach is good, isn't it? Because it explains both the positive and the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Aaron Beck are your positive symptoms. Sorry, uh, Anthony Morrison is your positive symptoms. And Aaron Beck with the cognitive triad looks at those negative symptoms. So just an overview then of that. Remember, we have got this flow chart to understand the process that Anthony Morrison links to those positive symptoms, the idea of that vicious circle. And then you've got Aaron Beck's cognitive triad for those negative symptoms. Okay, um, a little task for you to do. Um, if you close your eyes right now, um, take a moment and then open your eyes and look forward. Try and figure out how much information you take in from your environment, from all of your senses. So what can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? What can you taste? And what can you feel? And if you take a few minutes, actually, you begin to realise that there's quite a lot of information that gets propelled into our conscious mind. And sometimes it can be quite overwhelming. But us as normal functioning humans have the ability to filter out elements of our senses and elements of information from our environment so that we don't become overwhelmed. The idea here is that people with schizophrenia don't have that filter. They aren't able to filter out information. Okay, and they have this lack of a pre-conscious filter. So, for example, if I go back, if you are in a very busy classroom, for example, and lots and lots of people are talking, but you were having a conversation with the person next to you, you can almost sort of zone out of what any other noise is and you can focus solely on that one person. Same thing if you're completing an essay in lessons, lots of people could be talking around you, but you can almost filter it out and focus your attention onto one thing. But people with schizophrenia, like I said, can't do that. And that is the main element of Christopher Thrift's theory. He proposed that the core positive symptoms of schizophrenia could be explained by difficulties in inhibiting pre-conscious content. Normally, our senses receive a tremendous amount of information from our environment. This information reaches our awareness and we interpret it and that's our pre-conscious. So that's what you did when you opened your eyes. The best fit of the incoming information gets propelled into our consciousness, allowing us to make sense of the information. Thrift proposed that in some people with attentional filters, they inhibit most of the sensory information from making it out of the pre-conscious and they're essentially defective. They don't work with people that have schizophrenia. Thrift claims that this leads individuals with schizophrenia to become aware of ambiguous and multiple interpretations of events and they find it really difficult to select and carry through an appropriate cause of action. They've got a lot going on. If you can't filter out everything that's in your environment, I'm sure you can imagine that it was quite overwhelming for somebody 
and it may they may become quite distressed and they may not understand what to do to get out of that situation. One way that Christopher Thrift has tested this is with um, an idea of um, the Stroop test. Now, the Stroop test is a scientific method of understanding somebody's mind, how quick somebody's mind is. And I'm sure you've seen it used a lot, um, whether it be on social media, whether it be um, within an app or a game. Um, lots of people use it within studies of English language, but it's also used to understand our mental processes. And a mental process is a cognitive function, isn't it? So it makes sense that the cognitive approach use it. The idea of the street test is that you read the colour of the font, not what the word reads. So for example, in the case you can see on the slides, um, it would be red, blue, green, yellow, green, black, blue, red, yellow, black, yellow, blue, green, red, black. Um, and it does, you do have to really think about it. You almost have to not read the word and really just focus on the colour. Um, and it's a really difficult task and people can really, really struggle with it. A person that has schizophrenia would not be able to do that. So a way of testing this idea, um, Christopher Thrift's idea, is by showing them the Stroop test and they would become really, really overwhelmed and they would not be able to complete the task. So that's an empirical, scientific way of having evidence to back up Christopher Thrift's theory. Okay, so before we go on to look at the psychodynamic approach, um, just a quick recap then of the three elements of the cognitive approach. So you need to remember that you've got Anthony Morrison, who is your uh, positive symptoms with the sleep deprivation and the inappropriate assessment. Christopher Frith, which we've just gone through, who looks at the Stroop test and being able to understand and have that pre-conscious filter. And then we also have Aaron Beck, which is our negative symptoms, and it's looking at those um, three elements within the cognitive triad. So those three theorists make up your cognitive explanation of schizophrenia. The next thing to look at then is the psychodynamic explanation. And again, this is within our individual differences element. Now, psychodynamic theories and approaches are very common within this um, psychology A level, um, and you will have done them a lot last year. So, a lot of this should be um, a bit of a recap, and there shouldn't really be very many new elements within this section. Just a little recap then in terms of what um, you may have learned last year. So, some Freudian concepts. The main concept of Freud's theory is that he believes. Everything that happens to us in our childhood has an impact on us when we're older and our childhood experiences really shape who we become in adulthood. He proposed that psychological development in childhood takes place during five psychosexual stages and he named them oral, anal, phallic, latency and genital. He also put a lot of emphasis on the libido which is a person's overall sexual drive or desire for sexual activity. And he says that that really drives a lot of our behaviour. One really important element of his theory is this idea of the conscious and the unconscious mind. He said a lot about a person is underneath the water and what is in our conscious mind that we're aware of is just the tip of the iceberg. He says that we have got three elements to our personality. And he names them the id, the ego and the superego. The id is part of our personality, almost known as the devil on your shoulder. And it is based on the pleasure principle, quite childish, and it seeks selfish pleasure. Then the other side of it, we have got the superego, which is likened to the angel on your shoulder. 
um, based on the morality principle, so our morals, understanding what's right and wrong. And this develops at the end of the phallic stage and it seeks moral perfection. And then in the middle, we have got our ego and that is based on reality. The ego is almost sort of seen as the manager and it balances the opposing demands of the id and the superego. And that's where our idea of psychic conflict comes from. So a little bit more background then as to how Freud got to his explanation of schizophrenia. Started off by looking at Daniel Schriebra and he was a German judge who was hospitalised on three occasions and was then eventually diagnosed with something called dementia precox which is now known as schizophrenia. And what Daniel Schrieber did was he wrote a book, a really influential book called Memoirs of My Nervous Illness. And what Freud did was he read the book and he used the book to fuel his explanation. But something to note is that he never met or interviewed Daniel Schrieber in person. He based his own explanation of schizophrenia purely off of the book. In 1911, Freud published a 70-page monograph about Schrieber and entitled it Psychoanalytic Notes on an Autobiographical Account of a Case of Paranoia. And this was one of the few occasions where Freud actually attempted to apply his principles to explain schizophrenia. So, this is the first element. This explanation is kind of split into three elements. The first one is about fixation. Now we know the oral stage of development is when you are learning to feed, to breastfeed and it, the centre of your pleasure comes from your mouth. Um, the libido receives satisfaction from stimulation of the lips and the mouth. Most of the time the libido urges are satisfied by feeding from the mother's breast. However, if an infant receives too much, so if they're overindulged or too little oral stimulation, which means they become quite frustrated, they will become fixated. And we know that fixation means that you are stuck in a stage of development. If you're stuck in a stage of development, it's going to have an impact on your personality when you're older. Freud proposed that individuals with schizophrenia become fixated during the first one to two months of the oral stage of development. Now we know the oral stage of development is very early on it's our first psychosexual stage and our ego is really underdeveloped now if you think back to the slide previously our ego is our manager and it manages and the demands of the id and the super ego now if we don't have that ego to manage and to referee then our id okay our childish our quite um dominant side of our personality will take over okay and that is one of the main principles of Freud's theory. As an adult most people satisfy oral desires through activities such as kissing, smoking and chewing gum. However if as an adult an individual experiences excessive amounts of stress the individual may indeed regress back to the oral stage. Now if you think about it this is actually quite true because when we are stressed, our automatic thing is to put our hands near our mouth. When you're shocked, you normally cover your mouth. Or if you're stressed or feeling a bit anxious, you may chew on your nails or bite the skin around your fingers. Or you may chew on the end of your pen. Okay, and that actually, that is oral stimulation, isn't it? Regression is an ego defence mechanism which causes the ego to retreat back to an earlier stage. This may just be temporary or may continue over a long time. During the oral stage, the ego is not well developed. The role of the ego is to control the id's impulses and to try to balance the demands of the id with the moral limitations imposed by that superego. However, if an individual regresses back to a point where the ego doesn't exist, there is nothing stopping the id from complete, operating completely unimpeded. And Freud says that schizophrenia 
is your id taking over your personality. Symptoms of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations and delusions, are then supposedly the unchecked activity of the id, and that's because there's nothing there to manage it. A person loses touch with reality, and they're unable to distinguish between reality and their desires and fantasies. This state is little better than that of a newborn infant, and as such the individual with schizophrenia is typified by primary narcissism. They're very young, they don't know how to deal with situations, okay? They are very selfish. Whereas well-adjusted adults have well-developed egos with set limits on fantasy activity. This is not the case in adults with schizophrenia. So the next little section of this is to do with this schizophrenogenic mother. And Freud puts a lot of the idea of schizophrenia onto the relationship that you have with your mother. They consider the mother-child relationship to be one of the crucial factors in the development of schizophrenia. And your main researcher here is Frieda Fromm Reichmann. She's really important to bring into an essay. She says the schizophrenic um, is painfully distrustful and resentful of other people due to the severe early warp and rejection he encountered in important people in his infancy and childhood. As a rule, mainly the schizophrenogenic mother. This concept proposes that mothers of individuals are overprotective and controlling, but at the same time they're quite rejecting and they're quite distant. Now what happens is, because they are quite contrasting elements, it really does stifle the emotional development of, of a child. So the overprotection stifles the emotional development, but the emotional distance, the fact that she's quite rejecting, deprives the child of security, which means they don't really understand what to do when they're faced with stress and they're really, really vulnerable. And we know that when they're faced with stress, they regress back to that oral stage. They're very young and they don't know how to deal with the situation, which means that their ego can't rationalise what to do, which means that it takes over. OK, so really important, really important piece of research by Frieda from Reichman um, and a really nice new element of Freud's theory, isn't there here? OK, so there we have it. There is your overview of the individual differences, explanations of schizophrenia. I hope that they were helpful and I hope that I have tried my best to simplify them down as much as possible. Our next and last section um, session for Carlin Cymru will be on some exam technique for Unit 3. So I am going to choose some past paper questions and we are going to have a go at answering some of them. I really hope that this was useful and um, your resources in terms of this PowerPoint will also be available on the website. Thank you.